Mark Johnson was seated in a police station, across from the sergeant in charge quaking in fear. He had not slept a wink. He remained awake waiting for Susan. On many occasions he was tempted to leave his house, go to the police office in the city, and find out why his wife was being detained for so long. When two FBI agents took custody of his wife, they told him she would be back very soon. It had been 17 hours. With her continued detention and the absence of a call from the police, Mark had to conclude that the FBI had placed her under arrest. According to the two arresting agents, the FBI had received a complaint from the Indian police via their Interpol condits. In their complaint, the Indian police accused his wife of illegally publishing and circulating a provocative book in India without obtaining official permission from the Indian police authorities. The book detailed serious hate crimes and stirred up immense religious strife, which led to the eruption of violent riots between Muslims and Hindus. Furthermore, many Indians in Mumbai and other major cities in India were killed and many more were fatally wounded due to an unlicensed movie which they allege was financed and produced by his wife. Mark tried to convince the two FBI agents to take him along with his wife because he happened to be with her during her one-year stay in India. In addition, he informed them that he was involved with his wife in financing and CO producing the so-called provocative book and outrageous movie. Grimly, the two agents told him that he was not listed in the complaint. To calm down Mark the two agents advised him to contact his wife's lawyer the following morning and prepare for a possible legal dispute between her and the Indian police authorities. Mark found himself left with no choice, so he just wrote down the names of the two FBI officers. One of them was an old black man and the other was a young woman of Asian origin, possibly Indian, or Pakistani. Then, he allowed Susan to go with them for what they called a couple of hours of interrogation. Mark lurched into panic mode when the sergeant in charge told him that the police had no knowledge of any complaints against his wife nor was there any record of any police or FBI warrants against his wife or any directives to question her. In a stammering voice, Mark requested the officer to recheck his computer and find out who came last evening to his house and took his wife away. The officer rechecked his computer several times and even searched his desk for any clue to indicate that such a complaint had been received from India via the Interpol and that two FBI agents had acted on it. He even consulted his colleagues but none of them could shed any light on the situation. Then, the officer asked Mark to recall the evening's incident in detail and describe the two persons who had taken his wife away. After taking his statement, the sergeant sent two police officers with Mark to ascertain his story and investigate further. The officers combed Mark's house for clues, eventually questioning his mother-in-law and two daughters. The only thing that they found was that two persons came to the house the previous evening and took Susan Johnson away with them. The officers talked to some neighbors but no one seemed to have noticed the arrival of those two FBI agents at the Johnson residence. Mark Johnson had neglected to note the registration of the car used to ferry his wife. When the officers returned to their office, they duly registered a missing persons report on Mrs. Susan Johnson. Mark tried to convince the police that the two persons who claimed to be FBI agents had kidnapped his wife but the police believed that the conclusion was premature. Mark ignored the police and began to search for his wife all over the neighborhood. He traveled many miles and showed her photo everywhere he went but no one claimed to have seen her. There was no place left unsearched. After 48 hours, the police changed their collective minds and agreed that two perpetrators who claimed to be FBI agents probably did kidnap Mrs. Johnson. This announcement turned the FBI office upside down and left many top FBI officials sleepless. There were many urgent questions the FBI agents had to answer to their seniors and the media. How the two kidnappers came to know the address of Susan Johnson. How they surmised that the woman who wrote a book and produced a movie many years ago, was the same woman who traveled to India and produced a similar movie and published provocative religious literature in India. How did they come to know that Susan Johnson and Christina Lewinsky was the same person? Mark demanded that every FBI agent who was a Muslim or had relations with a Muslim partner or family to be interrogated. 
the FBI could not accommodate his request on the grounds that they could not question a person based on his religious affiliation. In order to support his demand, Mark quoted the example of the American-born Muslim, Major Nidal Hassan, who was led by the spirit of jihad and zeal for his religion, sprayed bullets on his fellow soldiers, killing 13 and wounded 30. He even referred to the recent case of the 24-year-old engineer, Muhammad Yusuf Abdulaziz who gunned down four Marines in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Muhammad was a naturalized American citizen born to a Palestinian father and a Kuwaiti mother. No one around him suspected that he was a radical or terrorist Muslim planning a terrorist attack. Friends and neighbors described Abdulaziz, a lover of soccer, someone who never caused trouble and who proudly graduated from college as an engineer, Reuters, July 18, 2015. The same old story, whenever a Muslim becomes and does what his religion requires him to do, carry out jihad in the way of Allah against the so-called infidels and enemies of God, his family members, neighbors, friends, teachers, classmates, boss and colleagues will describe him as sweet, cute, adorable, lovable, successful, smart, peaceful, and friendly fellow. They might not hesitate to nominate him for the Nobel Peace Prize laureates. They would never have expected him to do what he had done and seeing his photo in the media was unbelievable. Wow, an angel suddenly turned into a demon. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Still the FBI police refused to generalize and question their fellow officers simply because he or she was a Muslim or from an Asian background. Unless there was enough evidence, the FBI police contended that such a step would be discriminatory. After that request was denied, Mark requested the police to allow him see every Muslim working in the FBI or local police force in that city. His request was rejected on similar grounds and plus the fact that the descriptions he presented of the kidnappers did not match any of the police officers on the force. According to Mark, one was an African-American around 60 and the other was a young girl from an Indian or Pakistani background appearing in her mid-twenties. The FBI said they were not aware of any young girl meeting that description in their department. When all his demands were blocked, Mark put an ad in all major newspapers and promised to pay US$250,000 to anyone who would supply any information to leading to the whereabouts of his kidnapped wife or those who kidnapped her. Only a few officers in the FBI knew about the changing of Christina Lewinsky's alter ego. The same officers also knew that after the last failed murder attempt, Christina Lewinsky and her family sold their house, moved to another small town, bought a new house, changed her name and her husband's name, and began to live there. None of those officers knew that Susan and her husband had traveled to India, lived there for a year and produced a movie and a book over there. Even the media did not know that the author of the controversial book, which inspired a Hollywood movie, had faced an assassination attempt by her own brother. At that time, under the advice of the FBI police the case was reported to the media as a failed honor killing attempt. The media received information that a Pakistani Muslim student attempted to murder his Pakistani sister for forsaking Islam and marrying an American Jew who converted to Christianity. After marrying her American boyfriend, the Pakistani girl converted from Islam to Christianity. Her brother obtained a gun and went to her house to kill her. He found her at a lake with her American husband. He pulled out his gun and pointed it to her head. Before he fired, he began to curse her and tell her why he came all the way from Pakistan to kill her. The report further detailed that the brother was shot and killed by the police at the right time and the life of the sister was spared. As such, the assassination attempt was considered an honor-killing case and did not last more than a day or two in the media. When the FBI office could not answer any of their questions, the media concluded that it was an inside job and a big stigma for the American anti-terrorist entities. There was no place that had been left unsearched for the kidnapped wife. The FBI placed an additional bounty of $25,000 for information leading to the location of the abducted woman. In that way, three weeks passed without anyone finding Susan Johnson or supplying any meaningful information to her whereabouts. 
Meanwhile, Mark Johnson moved out of his house along with his mother-in-law and two daughters. This time Mark refused to change his name or go along with the FBI recommended relocation program for their protection. He chose to move to the city. He bought a house without informing the FBI or the local police. He hired his own private bodyguards and security guards and requested the police not to interfere in his family's affair from that point on. The plot of kidnapping Susan Johnson was initiated by a group of elite wealthy Indian Muslims in India and supported by a British police officer in the UK. The movie of Majnoon Layla that had been created by a Bollywood director and financed by an American couple was a big shock and disgrace to those wealthy Muslims. They had never anticipated that anyone would dare to insult the beautiful religion of Islam and aromatic life of Prophet Muhammad in the way that the movie did. What made them more furious was that at the beginning of the movie, the director stated that the movie was based on a true life story of a slum Muslim girl from Mumbai. Their initial inquiry revealed that the movie was based on a book written by an American woman. The book was produced in three important Indian languages, Hindi, Urdu, and English. Millions copies were sold all over Hindustan, today includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Jammu Kashmir, Afghanistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Burma, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Maldives, and Singapore. It had been translated in Arabic, Persian and Indonesian languages. Moreover, the movie was made available with subtitles in many international languages such as English, French, Dutch, Spanish, Arabic, Persian, and Indonesian. Three of the wealthy Muslim men pledged 90 million Indian rupees towards the extermination of their target. For a bounty of 2 million US dollars, any Indian would risk his life and he might agree to assassinate the President of the USA. Nevertheless, the three Muslim businessmen did not want to make it public in the fashion that the former spiritual leader of Iran did. Khomeini offered to pay 1 million US dollars anyone who would assassinate the Indo-British Salman Rushdie, the author of the controversial book, The Satanic Verses. Almost three decades had passed and no one was able to kill Rushdie. Therefore, the Indian Muslim men did not want to repeat the same mistake. They knew that by issuing a death fatwa, Khomeini had contributed to the furthering of the book and exposed it to over 6 billion non-Muslims. If he had not issued his fatwa, the satanic verses, the book might have only been read by a few thousands readers. The first step the Muslim men took was to find a reliable Muslim man and send him abroad to find people to do their dirty work. The person they hired was a British Muslim who was known as Sajid Khan. Sajid was born and brought up in the UK. He was very intelligent, having had all his schooling at UK. He earned a PhD in international law from Oxford University but became a professor at Cambridge University. Sajid spent all his life in the West and never visited the Third World. He was chosen for that secret assassination mission because he had a son working in the anti-terrorist department in London. The Muslim men came to know about him through one of his students. That student was the son of one of those men. Sajid was known for his defense of Islam. He believed that Islam is a religion of peace but had been hijacked by a few fanatic Muslim groups from the Middle East, Africa, Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. He felt it was the duty of the intellectual Muslims like him to defend their beautiful religion and holy prophet and expose the Western hidden agenda of trying to destroy Islam. He wrote many books on this topic. His son, Muhammad Khan shared his belief but he went further and claimed that the West exaggerated the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. He believed that over one and a half billion Muslims were collectively punished for the act of a few fanatic Muslims. Muhammad Khan secretly believed in the so-called conspiracy theory of September 11. He believed that September 11 was the creation of the US CIA. Sadly, his employment with the British police was not conducive to him being vocal about his stand. One of his father's students heard him speaking about his views when he came to dine in his house. And that student was the one who connected the three Muslim businessmen of Mumbai with Sajid and his son Muhammad Khan. 
The student in question was born and raised in Mumbai but sent by his wealthy father to study in the UK. He was studying medicine at Cambridge at the time the Muslim men were looking for an assassin. He was being tutored by Professor Sajid Khan. Through this Indian student, the three Muslim men were able to reach Sajid Khan and his son and convince them to participate in their plan. They promised Sajid and his son half million dollars if they could find someone in the USA to execute the kidnap and murder of the blasphemous Indian slut. They told them that after the production of the book and the movie, Majnoon Layla, no Muslim could walk on the streets, or walk inside an office or school in India with his head held up high. It wasn't only the huge amount of money but the damage that had been done to Islam and the Prophet Muhammad in India and in other Muslim countries which led the professor and his son to join the conspiracy. Muhammad Khan had a friend in the USA who also was working in the federal police force in America. That friend was originally from India. He was a Muslim who claimed to be secular. He did not share the religious views of his friend Muhammad Khan. He was one of those immigrants who claimed to be peace-loving and was a picture-perfect law-abiding American Muslim. When his family immigrated from India to the United States of America, he was a child of three. He did all his schooling in the States, passed his citizenship exams and signed up with the police force. Eventually he became a fully-fledged FBI agent. He was one of those Muslims who claimed to help the American police in finding fanatic Muslims who were potential terrorists. Some of his Muslim relatives and acquaintances hated him because they believed the West used him to spy on his Muslim brothers and sisters. Muhammad contacted him and disclosed his plan. He told him the three wealthy Indian Muslim men were prepared to give him a signed blank check and he could put in it any amount of money he wanted to have. This friend immediately agreed to join the plot but demanded a share of a million dollars. When the three Muslim businessmen learned about the demand they agreed to pay one million US dollars to the American Muslim FBI employee. The Muslim FBI agent was known as Malik Reza. According to the plan, Malik Reza had to travel to Mumbai and receive the first installment of his share. Malik claimed that his father died suddenly of a heart attack and he needed to fly to India to bury the body of his dead father. His excuse did not raise any suspicions and he was granted a week's bereavement leave. When he arrived at Mumbai, he checked into the Five Stars Taj Mahal Hotel. On the following day, he was advised to go to the State Bank of India and open an account. On the same day, someone transferred a quarter million of US dollars into it. Malik was told that he would get the rest of the one million dollars after the blasphemous Indian bitch was kidnapped and killed. The blasphemous slut should be kidnapped by Malik but the three wealthy men would send someone to kill her. Until the accursed woman was killed by their man and her assassination was verified by photographic evidence, Malik would not get his due share. To assure Malik that the wealthy men were not going to renege on the deal, the assassin would remain in his custody until the balance of the payment was concluded. This assassin was none other than the son of one of his employers. His name was Rashid Sheikh. After spending five days in that five-star hotel, Malik was flew back to the United States of America to execute the plot. At the same time, Sajid and his son, Muhammad Khan, were paid their first installments through the student who linked them to the three Muslim men. They were also paid a quarter of their share and the rest would be paid after the assassination of the blasphemous tramp.